Uh, the Honourable Mary Woodridge, MP, State, Minister, State Member for Doncaster, Minister for Mental Health, Minister for Community Services and Minister for Disability Services and Reform. Minister Woodridge was elected to the Victorian Legislative Assembly in 2006. Uh, prior to being elected to Parliament, she was CEO of the Foundation for Young Australians. She'd been a senior advisor to the Federal Minister for Industry. She'd also worked in New York with McKinsey and Company <coughs> and with the Consolidated Press Holdings in Sydney. With her appointment as Minister following the election of the Coalition Government in November 2010, she immediately set up an ambitious agenda of reform and improvement across her portfolios. The Minister has been at the forefront of the Coalition Government's major overhaul of the state child protection system, securing a full rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Victoria, uh, whole of government action plans in alcohol and drugs and also family violence, and reform of community mental health and alcohol and drug treatment systems, which is probably enough to be keeping anyone busy, I would have thought. Minister Woodridge continues to work hard to ensure services are effectively meeting the varied needs of Victoria's vulnerable families and individuals. Uh, please join me in welcoming Minister Woodridge. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, it's great to be here today and congratulations to you for uh, resurrecting the conference. It's an important conference um, and I welcome everyone to Melbourne. Uh, many of you are not from Melbourne, some of you are. You're enjoying our wonderful weather um, as always, um, but I think it, uh, we're very proud. Um, that this conference is uh, not only back underway but also back underway and being hosted here in Victoria. And as a government, we've been very proud to provide financial, intellectual and moral support for the process. So, um, uh, well done. And, and I know it's a very meaty uh, agenda that's already kicked off exceptionally well. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners who have loved and nurtured the land we meet on today for many, many hundreds of generations. For too long, children have been invisible in many aspects of our service system. And I think this is really at the heart of some of the reforms we're trying to do, is work out how to make children visible. And in Victoria, we've got a very proud history, and I, I won't boast for too long, um, but there's a number of things that, that we're very proud of that we continue to try and maintain. Things like the lowest rates of kids in out-of-home care, um, a particular f uh, focus uh, and investment in therapeutic approaches for children and young people, uh, engagement of our universal systems early in life, um, and very active involvement there. There's a lot of different things that we believe are real strengths of the service system. But we are very conscious that there is still so much to do. And when you look at, and for me, I think uh, some of the key um, things that really uh, hit the nail on the head were things like our child death review process. And I know many other states have this as well. But when you read about the stories and the experiences of children who have died who have been known to child protection, the very common theme is the presence of parental mental illness, parental alcohol and drug abuse and violence in the home. And when you look at the profile of young people in the youth justice system and you see the prevalence of their engagement with the child protection system, their uh, uh, incidents of mental illness, intellectual disability, uh, violence, their offending connected to alcohol and drug use, uh, their disengagement with school. When you look at the churn through the system and you see the repeated readmissions, the repeated resubstantiations, the repeated reconvictions, um, you see a, a picture and a cycle of what's happening for very vulnerable families. And not only do they have incredibly complex and challenging lives, but that complexity seems to be increasing as well. So what we were seeing is a very, uh, and we, we will all be seeing it, is this very common theme of um, a service system that currently responds individually to mental illness or alcohol and drug use or violence in the home or intellectual disability or housing instability where really it's all the same clients. And we have a, a service system that had been structured in such a way to respond to an individual issue without the capacity to take that step back and look at that range of complexity, the range of challenges, the range of issues in the family context. 
for that individual, but also um, in relation to what's going on around them. So the key reform and the changes that we're trying to drive in Victoria is trying to go to the heart of that issue of um, currently having a very siloed system with structures and processes and funding and uh, agreements and KPIs all structured around individual components of issues and take that step back and actually look at are we changing and creating and assisting in positive outcomes for vulnerable families. So we are seeking to drive reform that we're calling Services Connect. What Services Connect seeks to do is address those issues that I've just highlighted. To work with an individual and their family and address the full range of issues that they face. And some of the key elements to get away from that, away from the, the system that we've had, is can we have just one assessment rather than families and individuals having to tell their stories multiple times? Can we have one key worker rather than the multitude of workers that currently um, we see with so many families? And can we have one plan rather than a multitude of plans, sometimes conflicting with each other plans, um, and just have one plan that once again looks at that family context? And this is the Services Connect system that we are currently setting up, that one assessment, one key worker, one plan, to be delivered um, working with that family. And it's not just about another level of service coordination being put over the top of everything that's already happening. It's actually about trying to remove the layers of, of, of coordination that's in place and to simplify the approach. So let me give you an example. We've been trialling Services Connect in three locations over the last 18 months. And I want to tell you about Joe and his family. We've been working across a range of those, those types of services for eight years with Joe's family. In that time, they have had 27 different workers working with the families. We estimate probably about half a million dollars of service provision has been provided to his family. There's been, over that time, 17 different notifications to child protection for anywhere between his one to four children mental health services, child protection services, housing services, and so on, have all been engaged. Now, Joe's family have come into our Services Connect trial. And what we've seen, particularly by having the key worker, is the key worker actually removed a lot of the additional services that were being provided. Because what Joe was saying was, people would turn up and sometimes I didn't even know why they were there or what they were there for. So it simplified the support to those workers that were actually usefully engaging and connecting with the family. What we've found through the process of working the key worker, working with Joe and his family to make a plan for the future and to, to simplify the service provision is he talks about mental health getting under control for him and his wife, the home now being clean, the kids being at school, the uh, kids are now uh, going to scouts and one of the things that really struck me is he said for the first time the kids were actually able to have other kids around to have play dates. Some of the things, the really simple things that you want for your children and for families, they're now being able to deliver. And Joe's now re-engaged with learning and hopes to get a job again next year. So by simplifying this process, by having a, a single assessment, a single key worker and a single plan, that has been a pathway for Joe to actually um, get his life and for the family back on track. And, and for me, a very powerful example of what's possible. Now, that's not going to work for everyone, but I have no doubt that we, with this um, coordinated, simplified approach that looks at the full range of issues, um, we will get much better outcomes for our clients and our families. As I said, we're trialling it in three sites. We're rolling it out to two, two more. But we're integrating not only human services, but also targeted health services like mental health and drugs. Uh, and the family is very much at the centre of decision making. And at its heart is about building the capabilities of families to be able to drive the solutions that they want and ultimately to have independence to be able to manage their lives. So it is a different way of working. It's a different way of thinking. And I think some of the challenges we've got is how far can we go with this model? 
What does this mean for services like statutory child protection? And we're having those debates now. We can do it for the service system, we can do it for DHS, we can do it with the community sector organisations. How far can we push to incorporate that full range of response that's needed for vulnerable families? To make this sort of change, it's supported in a whole lot of different ways. And um, the, on the structural front, there's been a number of things that we've done. Now, anyone in Victoria who works with the Department of Human Services would know that DHS has gone through a very substantial restructure. We've basically blown up the department and put it back together again. Jill's <laughs> cringing at that look, that comment. But, but essentially what we've gone is from being structured in silos to being structured in teams and to pushing the capacity back out to the regions so and putting more senior people with the capacity to make decisions at a local level than centralised in head office. And it's early days and you work through it, but that idea of no longer, you know, you're a housing client and you go and talk to someone else about disability issues and someone else about child protection, but being able to solve problems by a team-based approach with that full range of skills and capacities starts to go to that heart of breaking down the silos in the system. We've also recently had Professor Peter Shergold, who would be known to many of you, um, look at uh, the relationship between the community sector and the government. Now, one of the things that we're very proud about in Victoria is the role that our community sector organisations play as a critical part of our service system and actually, generally, uh, the significant and substantial deliverer of government-funded services. What we want to do is make sure that our community sector has the capacity, has the skills, has the expertise um, and has uh, the sustainability in the long term to continue to provide those services and hopefully over time provide more of those services. So the report I released just a week ago from Professor Peter Shergold sets us a plan for the relationship between government and the community sector to make sure that both have a partnership approach that supports and builds the capacity of the community sector for the future. And I think we've got a real roadmap to form and there's some, some interesting stuff if people are, are interested in having a, lot, a bit more of a look at, on the DHS website. We've also restructured on the structure front our child protection workforce, and Jill's going to talk a bit more about this um, in her uh, contribution. But essentially what we're looking to do and what we've done is make sure we have more experienced workers working more often with more families. And so once again, putting that capacity back out at the grassroots rather than um, holding it all centrally. And what that means is we have more senior people able to make decisions more quickly in relation to families and what's happening. We have more support for our junior workforce and the front line. Um, and once again, we think these are the sorts of things, structural things we need to do to support having a better response for families. Now, these are structural approaches. They also need to be supported, I think, um, by work that we're doing on a range of strategies um, and a range of different ways of working um, and approaches. So as um, Adam mentioned, we've done a number of strategies in each of the particular areas, family violence, violence against women, um, vulnerable children, mental health, alcohol and drugs and so on. And what's happening in each of these strategies is we're getting the same themes back every time. Because I believe what I've been talking about is not rocket science, it's not that new. It's just that people and services um, and agencies have been trying to deliver joined up responsive family-centred um, programs and support in spite of government rather than in, with support of government. And the themes that keep coming up with the work that we're doing are very consistent. We need that integrated response with um, uh, taking the family and putting that in context. So let me give you a couple of examples of things that we're doing that's going to change the way what we've done in the past. We're currently recommissioning our alcohol and drug and community mental health services. Uh, this is going to make sure we've got better access, better coverage, better quality of services, better um, uh, quality, uh, equity of services right across the whole state. But one of the things we've done there in the intake and assessment is say not only is the intake and assessment about the adult who's in front of you at the time, but we want you to incorporate an understanding of the family context of that individual who's presenting. 
um, who are their carers, and particularly who are dependent children. And what decisions are you going to recommend about dependent children as well as a treatment um, pathway for the adult who's in front of you? And so suddenly, for me, this is very much about making children visible. So, you know, we've all heard the stories of uh, an adult being discharged from a mental health unit going home, looking after small children and everything breaking down and obviously some of the vulnerability um, and concerns that can arise. So this, this gets to the heart of saying we've got to look at people in their family context and make good decisions, particularly for vulnerable children as well as for the individual who's accessing those mental health or drug treatment services. We've also put in place youth foyers, um, which look to address not only youth homelessness with their housing, but while we have young people who have been homeless, um, how can we encourage them on the skills, education and employment path? And by the way, what other services and support do they need at the same time? And on the violence against women side of things, we've put together multidisciplinary centres where we actually bring together police, child protection workers and our sexual assault, assault counsellors through CASAs, um, all together in the one location. This idea of bringing together an integrated response so that we can actually look at the full range of issues rather than um, just one that's presenting to us in our specialised way at any one time. Another key theme, as well as um, the integrated response in the family context, is of course the therapeutic approach. And I know you've already had a session on that and there's more to, to be talking about it. But we are really trying as hard as we can to put a trauma-informed approach at the heart of everything we do. So our out-of-home care, um, we are um, progressively increasing our residential care that has uh, that is um, approached in a uh, that that is a therapeutic resi. Um, we're in the process of doubling our foster care that's therapeutic foster care, um, and and realising and through the evaluations, as you'll all know, the the dramatic difference that can make, uh, the difference in emotional health, the difference in placement stability, uh, relationship with family, and so on that taking that trauma informed approach can do. The other area where we've had a, a wonderful response is we've actually trained our guards in our youth justice services about therapeutic care and about trauma. And they are now bringing a trauma-informed approach to the young people that they're working with at Parkville and Malmesbury Youth Justice Centres. And that is making a substantial difference in terms of the way that they are interacting and their engagement with young people um, in the youth justice system. We've also, we're very proud, put a, uh, established a school. Um, at Parkville, one of the things that really amazed me early on is that our young people under 18, incarcerated, were getting on average about four or five hours of education a week. Um, in the last 18 months, we have now established a school at Parkville where every single resident um, does at least 30 hours of education a week, um, and that's seven days a week often, and that's 52 weeks a year. And once again, we're getting incredibly positive results by, and that, that, that schooling is very much a trauma-informed approach and very much on the basics of reading and writing. We're getting very positive results in terms of um, not only the educational outcomes, but also um, the incidence and the uh, violence and aggression within the centre itself has massively reduced because young people are busy, the, the, the guards, the people who are working with them, can work with them in a therapeutic way and we're having very positive results. The third key area um, in terms of change is, of course, place-based. Once again, something everyone's uh, talking about regularly. And I've already mentioned for the DHS restructure how we sought to, um, in changing the, the balance between the number of staff located in the community and out in regional and country and metropolitan areas versus those at head office. And also, though, pushing that decision-making down. I mean, one of the things that you see with uh, children in child protection, particularly those who have been there for a long time, is often the decision-making is incredibly slow. And so how do we actually make sure decisions can be made by people who have the capacity and the skills and the expertise to make those decisions well, you put the decision-making closer to where the children and families are, and that's what we've been trying to do so that there are stronger regional capacity um, in terms of our decision-making. And one of the commitments that we've made is the establishment of local networks, and we're in the midst of having this debate at the moment. Well, how much decision-making can we push to a local area? How much... Uh, 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 reflecting the differences 
um, in different geographic areas and therefore the need for a differential response in different areas, how can we actually build the capacity of local communities to determine what's needed, determine what response is then needed and then actually have the capacity to make decisions and influence what services are provided to meet the needs of their local community. And it's a fascinating debate, um, but I think a really important one, once again, to having a better place-based response. The, the fourth thing and the last thing I'll touch on just in terms of the strategies and uh, that we've, uh, the, the common themes that have come out of the work that we've done that we're trying to put in place across the board, is this idea of shared responsibility. And one thing that I was amazed coming in as Minister is how often, not just from my colleagues, but from the community, from other um, parts of government, from right across the board, that there, while there was an interest and a concern for, for particularly vulnerable young people, there was a relief that DHS was looking after it. And that sense of, um, I do care, I am concerned, but you're looking after it and it's someone else's problem. And the such clear theme through everything that we've done, whether it's violence against women, whether it's child protection, whether it's mental health and so on, is that it actually needs to be a shared responsibility, that we all have a role in this. And it's not just right across government, but it's also right across the community sector, it's business, it's the community as a whole. And that it's really important that we all have a sense of what role we can play, what difference we can make, and how we need to actively engage on these issues to, to achieve positive outcomes. What we're finding is that um, as a result of these types of reforms and these types of changes, that we want to and we are able to work with families earlier. Obviously what we've always wanted to do but that we are seeking to address the issues so that not only can we help um, families get things back on track, but we're keeping people out of the system if we can do that effectively. And what that means is that those who need the assistance, rather than having massively stretched resources, you've got greater capacity to respond to those in need, but if you can work proactively to keep them out of the system in the first place, that's a much better outcome for everyone. So, Essentially, the message I'm trying to get is this give you a sense of this broader reform in terms of connecting up services, having an integrated family response, putting in place the structures that enable to do that, not just in government, but right across the community sector um, and, and broadly, and making sure that we actually try and put in practice and support and drive what we all know we've needed, a, a family-centred integrated response that takes a therapeutic approach that reflects local place-based geographic differences and where we all have a role to play in terms of the solutions. So it's a pretty exciting time of change. Um, I always say is we're not going to get everything right, um, but I think directionally we know where we want to go, we know what changes are needed, we know what difference that will make, and then we can adjust and improve um, and be informed and, and so on as we go. Um, children and young people, um, uh, you really need to, as where I started, be visible in the system. Um, and there's lots of things that can be done to make sure that's the case. Um, so in, in concluding my remarks, I want to commend you for the work that you all do, um, both you know, here and, and interstate and, and across the country. It is such important work, working with vulnerable families and particularly vulnerable children. Um, I know that we are all focused on the same objective, um, which is making sure that um, everything we do, we improve the capacity of vulnerable children to live happy, productive, independent lives. It's certainly an important goal. Um, and I believe that um, working together, sharing ideas, sharing what we're learning um, and, and coming together at events like this is really important and a, a really positive steps forward for vulnerable children in the, in, the, in the state and in the country. Thanks very much.